had to ask my husband some questions. I wanted some weights and stuff on the shackles and stuff that they use um, when they're detaining or restraining a prisoner. And since he works in the state of Illinois and they pretty well all use the same type of equipment nationwide, they're kind of governed by the federal government on their institutions. Curtis, Victoria, Tammy. So we're gonna go, we'll go ahead and get started, and I'm sure some there'll be others that are joining in, and we'll just leave this up for a while. Um, a lot of people had questions regarding, and we'll start with that first. Is so, um, what started was this initial the June fifteenth and sixteenth days were actually scheduled. Um, I'm sorry you can't see me, Brandy. It's just the way I've got to hold this, my iPad right now. But you can see me. I'm here. I'm laying in my bed. Sorry, but I got to hold the hold it this way so I can read my notes. Um. Anyway, um, this was supposed to be initially a bail hearing that was postponed from February to the 14th and 15th of June, which then after some um, requests and some some subpoenas went out uh there were sides that disagreed on who should get what and the defense didn't want them having certain uh records from the prison um and so it was going to be a suppression hearing because the state really wanted the records and uh the defense didn't want them to be let out so anyway that's what we thought we were going in for was to hear these motions and we were told the night before to expect a longer than usual day, but we weren't told why. Um, so anyway, we the court opened for people to come in at 8 o'clock. Um, even those that were coming in to do regular business inside the courtroom, like to pay taxes or to get from the auditor or whatever, they had to go through the same security process as what we did. Um, there was a heavy presence of law enforcement on the outside and a real heavy one on the inside. Um, so we got there. It was about, oh, I would say 540, and there was three people ahead of us, and that was the murder sheet and uh, Rick Snay. Um, I get you guys are familiar with those. Rick is a YouTuber. Anyway, we chatted a while, um, and we waited, and finally they opened the doors at um, 8 o'clock and they would only allow like three people in at a time they put them through security and then you were on your way up to the third floor um, beautiful beautiful um, courthouse a lot of history in there a lot of beautiful artwork stained glass just a beautiful court um, so anyway we made it through um, we were fortunate because we got in the first row and the acoustics their uh, system their microphones, I don't know if they weren't working right in the courtroom, but they the sound was very poor. You really had to struggle to hear a couple of the witnesses. And so we'll talk about those witnesses who got called by the prosecution and who got called for the defense. So as far as family goes um, in the courtroom. So in this courtroom, there's, I would say, I think they said 60, there were 62 seats available. And they had the courtroom, the first set of seats, um, right up next to the well where the prosecutor and the defense set, nobody was allowed to sit in that first row of chairs. And so the second row, back to the back part of the court, there's 62 seats in there. As you're looking at the judge, where the jury will actually sit would be to your, to our right, and to her left when the when the trial actually takes place um real and it had a really nice jury box um so hopefully they can get their sound checked out by then and get it working because it, really it was a struggle to hear some of them i felt bad for the people that were in the back that they probably couldn't hear a whole lot um the first ones we got we got inside the courtroom about i'd say 806 and about 8.30, 8.40, they brought in, um, they escorted um, Richard Allen's family in, who consisted of his wife, Kathy, and his mom. 
and then there was one guy that sat between us and them and we were in this first row with them and then all the others kind of joined in uh, that had been waiting in line to get in until the, there was like the west side of the courtroom was I'd say 90% of that rows over there were all reserved they were reserved for the family of uh, Abby and Libby's family uh, law enforcement but there's no seats safe for media there's it's just open to whoever comes up next uh, who comes in and then on the side that we were sitting on which would have been behind the defense directly behind Al, um, Richard Allen um, his mom and his sister I mean his mom and his wife sat right next to us just a guy separated us so they brought them in like I said it was about 20 to 9 um, and so everybody was kind of talking and stuff and then um, uh, about 10 o'clock or a few minutes after uh, the defense came in and the uh, prosecution came in Nick was the only one there as far as the prosecutor uh, Shane was not there yesterday um, for the defense there was mr. I'm gonna try to say his name correctly but if it comes out wrong it just does it's that uh, mr. Rosie um, or Rosy I call him Rosie but it's probably Rosie uh, Mr. Baldwin, they were the two main ones. Rosie is his first chair. Baldwin would be considered second chair. And then they had uh, five other um, staff members with them that sat behind them in seats that were provided. So then shortly after they had their seats and everybody was sat down, um, deputies came in and kind of cordoned off everybody and made sure nobody stood up or moved and you heard the door open to the back of the courthouse room um, and that's when they brought Richard Allen in now Richard Allen walked as he walked he was looking around and gazing around and it, as he was it seemed to me like he was looking at someone or looking like he was lost one of the two to me he seemed like he was probably medicated um, you know and he may be I mean him they may be tried different medications on him but he did seem he didn't seem dazed and confused like he didn't know where he was it was like he was just looking for something but he didn't I don't think he noticed that his mom and his wife was sitting where they were in that first row with us and as his mom saw him she kind of gasped and started crying uh, which was emotional um, Kathy was crying when, but when his mom saw him because I don't think his mom has seen him since he lost all this weight so he was um, he was in restraints uh, his hands his feet he had a, a black he had a chain around his waist um, he also had a black vest on with a box on the back of it and that is only used during transportation uh, when they're moving him according to um, of the warden and he explained that that vest is sort of used like a taser would be if you had uh, a problem trans during transportation and that becomes a big issue in this case and I'll explain that here in a minute so the, everybody came in and then the judge came in we all stood as as you should and uh, the bailiff announced when she was coming in um, she is a very strong woman very and, and she presents herself in that manner she doesn't um, she just a, you can tell she's a very she's very professional at what she does so she announced that this was supposed to be a suppression hearing but due to some circumstances they had changed it now to something else and we all kind of looked at each other and we thought oh what's going on now you know um, because this was supposed to be a bail hearing so the suppression hearing she went on to say that that would be rescheduled at a different time and then she went into that today's hearing would be over due process and about um, the defense wanting Richard Allen moved um, out of Westfield Westville Correction Center um, which is a max security in Indiana which is about an hour and a half 
um, from Cass County and from his lead um, from Mr. Rossi's office. So um, once everything was settled and she explained what was going on, she did go on to explain that she is going to be unsealing documents. She will have a web page set up, and as soon as I get that, I'll post that to you guys, and you guys or and you guys can also keep an eye on it. Um, if you see um, Honorable Fran Gull um, out of Allen County, but she will be setting a web page up strictly to post um, unsealed documents that she's going to unseal, and you're free to go in there, read them. Nobody's going to get charged for them. Nobody can watermark them. You don't have to pay somebody to watch them. You can go in there, read them yourself, or download them. I'm also going to ask for transcripts um, from the proceedings from yesterday if they're available. I'm going to buy a set of them, and I'll post them on here for you all. You can read them and hear for yourself what took place yesterday and the order that it took place in. There were some uncomfortable periods of time, but overall, I think it went pretty smooth. Um, court actually didn't start till 10, 13. But after she made those announcements about the, what type of hearing this was going to be and that her. So basically, there was uh, a motion put in by Mystery Sheets, a.k.a. Murder Sheets and ABC affiliate um, that they felt like the law of the document should not be sealed now uh, since there's been an arrest. And they cited a couple of laws in Indiana, which were valid points and so I'm not sure what records she did not indicate what records she will be unsealing but we'll see in the next week she was hoping that she would have that up and loaded on next next week sometime so we'll have to wait and see on that um then since it was the defense's motion the defense went first on this so they there was a total of six witnesses before the witness before they even started the defense asked the, for a separation of witnesses he didn't want the witnesses all in the same room testifying and the other witnesses in there so the four the six witnesses that were going to be called were then escorted out the door and so that then started the process um the defense started um he brought many things that were bothering him and the fact that richard allen was not a convicted criminal and he shouldn't be being housed where he is um that he's treated like a dog and that uh, and those were his words um treated like a pow which i strongly just totally disagree with that statement but those were his own words. So um, he he was upset with uh, Westfield. He still is with Westfield Correctional Center. And I think what it is is when the photo came out, and I thought the gag order meant for all of us that not I mean for all of them that nobody could put anything out, but that picture that he got out. And the story behind the picture and how frail he looked. That took place in April. Well, as it turns out, he was sent out for some medical care, but he was never completely moved out of Westfield Correctional Center. Um, after some medical testing, he was brought back to the Westfield Center. And that's where he remains and that's where he will until the judge decides. So they, he was upset about that. He claims that Carroll County hijacked um, that plan of moving um, Richard Allen. That was his words, that he hijacked that motion because they refused to be, they refused to transport him, they're, that they're not able to transport him and they're not able to keep him in a safekeeping manner. And there is a safekeeping, what they call a safekeeping order in place that was ordered um, I believe on October 31st or the 1st of November when he was first arrested. Um, at that point, he was transported to White County, which is north of um, Delphi. And he was sent there until he was sent to the IDOC uh, processing. And then they moved him up to Westville. 
um, which is not that uncommon that they are kept. This is high profile. So back a um, long time, well, not a long time ago, but when Mike Tyson was in the Indiana prison system for biting this guy's ear off, he was actually kept at the boys' prison versus in a men's prison because they didn't want to run into any safety issues with him being in prison in Indiana. So, I mean, things like that happen. They have to make adjustments. So, anyway, um, again, the suppression hearing, and there'll be probably, I would say, three or four more hearings before the trial. Um, his, the defense really pushed that, they, that they're wanting this trial done. So he's not going to waive his speedy trial, but they del they agreed on the delays dates, and due to her calendar being so heavy, and she has several, and I can't remember the exact number of murder cases that she's currently hearing. Um, the state of Indiana did give her um, what they consider an Indiana uh, senior judge, and uh, who will fill in for her on her cases whenever there is a hearing that has to be done for this case, it takes her away from her main docket in Allen County. Um, so also we know that um, the jury will come out of Allen County. So those hearings for the jurors will be held in Allen County, not in Carroll County. Uh, questionnaires will go out probably early December, maybe end of November. Uh, she did offer, um, he, they did offer, she offered them um, help with the jury questionnaires, and they will they will be sending those out, like I said, it, the end of November, 1st of December, because they will be seated before the trial starts. The trial starts January 8th. Um, first, she was only going to schedule it for two weeks, and the defense said that uh, that might be pushing it, so she did three weeks. Now, that could even be changed to go out longer. Unless something changes and he would enter a plea, that's the court date that will happen. The trial will happen in that time frame. Um, and again, that, you know, a circumstance may change where he wants to plea and just be done with it. I don't know. It's really hard to say. So um, the judge was pretty fair. Um, the defense raised a few times of an objection and she would say I really don't want to hear about objections in this type of hearing so she was fair to both sides um like I said when Richard Allen came in um he to me he didn't look sick he just looked like somebody that lost you know probably 75 80 pounds um the way he walked he was kind of restrained but you could tell his movements weren't totally impinged. Um, and we'll get into more of the black box and how the defense really was not nice about it. they They just, you can tell that Mr. Razi and the warden is not having a pleasant time. So uh, the first witness that the defense called, remember this was the defense motion, so it, it, it was their baby to handle from that point. Uh, the first witness they called was, mm, let's see, was Tall Gillespie, who is, I mean, who's the chief deputy now, but he was ex-sheriff at the time of the murders, and then as, um, his term limits, you can serve two terms in Indiana sheriff for four years, so it makes a total of eight. And so he is now the chief deputy, and Tony Liggett became the sheriff January 1st. So the first thing that um, the defense hammered on, Dr. and most of this is going to be when I say defense attorney, I'm going to be referring to Rossi, unless I mention Mr. Baldwin, um, uh, Rosie, uh really hammered away at how that order for safekeeping came about and why why he felt like he couldn't keep him safe in Carroll County, m meaning Allen safe in Carroll County. So, um, Mr. I mean Deputy or Lesenby explained that their jail is um, it, it's very dated, very. Um, and it holds the max of 
can't see you. I'm sorry. I, I've got my notebook on my lap. I'm here. Really, it's me talking. Um, the max that it handles is 34 prisoners. Um, they do not have a medical personnel, personnel on all the time. They do not have the means to take care of a high a high risk uh, inmate like Mr. Allen. Um, but the defense was trying to get out of Tob Lesenby, who wrote that order for you? Because you certainly, you know, where'd you get that wording for that? He was he was interesting where that came from. And so Tob said though, he went to the court system. Well, every county in Indiana has a, a county uh, attorney. So to me, it sounded like what Tobe to was trying to say was that he got help from the county attorney in writing that safekeeping order. And keep in mind, the judge, the first judge, Deemer, was the one that signed it and agreed that he should be moved to other county. Well, the defense wanted to know, well, how do you know he wouldn't be safe in your county? And Tobe said he was afraid for the man's life that, you know, somebody could get to him inside that little jail and that he simply just didn't have the manpower to take care of it. It's a very small department, their sheriff's department, I think seven or eight deputies at the mats, and they were all there at the courthouse yesterday. They do have a jail commander, um, and but he's just one guy, and they're so short-staffed. They do ask, you know, they're trying to get more help just, I mean, in every county jail in Indiana is seeing the same thing. I think nationwide you're seeing it. It's just, there's just hard to retain people anymore. Um, when you can go to a factory and make triple what these guys are making. So the big thing I told was questioning over the due process um, of that safekeeping order. He really hammered away on him. Um, I think what he was trying to get at, he felt, I think Rosie felt like um, the prosecutor helped him with the order, but that wasn't the case. Um, and Tobe said yes, that he wanted him kept at IDOC when he was in charge. Um, and again, he said, why? Why did he need to be kept at a, a high, a maximum security place when that's the worst of worst people? And Sheriff Lesenby, or yeah, Sheriff Lesenby said he really felt that he wouldn't be able to keep him safe. And so there was a little bit back and forth there. And then um, he wanted to know where he got his information from as far as any threats. He, because if you go back and you read it, which I suggest for everybody can go back and read it, um, paragraph three was brought up a lot in that. And you can go back and look at it's on our on our if you go back in the photos you can see that safe keeping order and paragraph three paragraph four which he said the defense asked him well do you know of any credible threats that were made to alan and deputy lesenby said no not at that current time he didn't and he wanted to know where he had heard anything he said well from the media you know and how more the more information that got out, the more he was at risk, which I totally agree. Um, you could have, you know, somebody wanting to be a local hero who really thinks this guy is guilty before he even gets to his day in court. And, you know, hey, I'll do us all a favor. And, and it does happen. It happens everywhere. In fact, there's a guy in Wisconsin that brags about he takes out the child predators inside that prison. Um, let's see. So that was, that was the big thing. And, um, again, Alan's attorney, um, questioned, uh, Tobe about, well, you kept him there for how many nights? And Tobe said uh, he thought it was three nights. And then after the hearing on the 31st, or after the initial hearing on the 30th, I believe, or the 29th, he was moved to White County and he spent a week there. Um, 
And so then we went on to, and that seemed the, big, the biggest thing. He was trying to, he really wanted more information of where Tobe got that order from and how he got that worded the way it did that the judge signed it. Um, but you got to keep in mind, not only did Judge Deemer sign it, so did Judge uh, Gull when she took it, took it over. She did back that up. Um, let's see. Again, like I said, it's not abnormal um, in your smaller counties. Now, our jail can hold up to 250. Um, and we will house, like, low low offenders from the state prison. And that helps pay for your new jails and stuff that are being built in Indiana. Um, plus, like if you have a county whose jail is being sued already or, or has some problems within, they will only be, they're limited to how many inmates they can keep and then they'll transfer inmates over to another county and then that county is reimbursed for their care. Um, so then he asked about, would it be normal if he, was to come see a client in Carroll County, would he be subject to like being searched? Would he be, you know, as a attorney and Sheriff Lesenby said, it's a probability. It, I mean, everybody goes through the same process. Um, so again, th this is not just a routine case. This is a whole, you know, a high profile case. Uh, again, I know he's not been found guilty yet, but they gotta also keep him safe and, that's the big thing is keeping him safe. Um, when we get into what the, the warden said, what I found him just, he was an amazing witness. He didn't, he didn't cut words. He just said it how, how things were, you know, and how things happened in his system and how, uh, Richard Allen actually has more freedom than anybody in his, in his, in his, um, prison right now and we'll get into what he said about that um like i said he asked about being searched if he'd been kept at carroll county and he said yes um and then um he asked tobe if the statements in the safekeeping document if they were false and he said no none of them were false they were all true that he couldn't keep him safe um so he really was hung up on that part of it um then the next one up um after he was dismissed and the prosecutor didn't have too many questions for him other than he reaffirmed where he got the order from and asked him as if today if he was to move um him Allen back down to Carroll County, would he be safe? And in his opinion, he would not be safe. Um, and they're not willing, they don't have the manpower, even if he's kept in another county, it goes back to that county for transportation and we'll get into that. So even if he was moved to Cass County, Carroll County would be responsible for transportation. And they, they said there's no way they can safely move him. Um, so the big thing there is his safety. So then the next one in the defense called is Max Baker. He is an intern for uh, Mr. Rossi. And he had been up to see Mr. Allen in December one time and three times in May. And he said he was, he, he described um, the difference in his appearance um, from December to May and how much weight he had lost how um, he would not make sense about certain statements he would make. He would be repetitive over um, saying something. He would repeat it over and over again. Um, that he would seem withdrawn at times. Sometimes he'd be engaging with him, with them. Um, he, this intern would often see, it sounds like the intern has actually seen him more than his own attorney to tell you the truth. Um, he would take him a lot of the documents, um, and when he would take the documents into the prison, the cell that Richard Allen's being kept in is like a prison inside of a prison. So you have different areas, and this part 
they would be parked in the parking lot, enter through, be searched, then put into um, one of the IDOC vans and then transported to the pod where he's being kept at, which is an administrative pod. Um, I'm not going to say the number that they gave. You guys can read it if I get the, the transcripts and it will tell near the, where he's being kept at as far as the pod. Um, the young man's only 20 years old and he's from Logansport. Um, he's uh, attending IU to become an attorney. Um, but he was very upset over the conditions um, that he found him in. Um, so he brought it back, the information back to Mr. Rossi and Mr. Um, Baldwin. And that's when the, they went up there and the picture was taken. So, um, the big thing there was they felt like they were being treated more harshly after that photo came out of, um, of Richard Allen after he lost the weight and how he was being treated by the staff up at uh, Westfield. Um, they weren't supposed to be taking cell phones in or computers in to the prison. The first visit, somehow they allowed it, um, but it by their SOPs, which is standards of operation protocols, they're not allowed to, they weren't supposed to, but they got away with it the first time and following times they didn't get away with it. And that upset Mr. Rossi how they changed that rule, but he was able to, you know, the board was saying, no, that is the standard protocol for them. So anyway, in on May 30th, um, the young man, Max, went with Mr. Rossi and with Kathy, um, Richard Allen's wife. And that was the first time she had actually seen him incarcerated since, uh, well, he'd been to court, but since he lost all that weight. Um, they had some alone time um, in the cafeteria um, in the in a cafeteria type setting where um, it sounded like where the where the corrections officers would have their you know free time and during that time when that hour long visitation was going on, they had shut down all visits to that prison because he was having a visitor and they wanted to go as smoothly as possible and not run into any issues. So all visits for other inmates were cut off for that hour and Kathy and Richard got to speak there and talk in person face to face. Uh, other inmates do not get the face to face time like what Richard Allen does up there. Richard Allen, you remember, he's not been convicted yet, so he's just being housed up there. So he's allotted and he went through, the warden went through a lot of things that he is allowed and the other ones aren't. So it was, it, I mean, to me, it sounded pretty fair. And I mean, to take a 50 year old guy who's not been locked up forever and, you know, has had his freedom and, you know, allowed to go out and eat anything he wanted, do what he wanted. And, you know, by all accounts of uh, family, friends and stuff saying that, you know, he did enjoy his beer and his cigarettes and he's not having that beer. And, you know, that alone could make drop some weight. So then after Max, uh, they called in um, Captain, let's make sure I get his name right. He is a captain of. Captain Gary Lewis. He has had the main, most contact with um, uh, Richard Allen. Um, Richard Allen has not always been in a suicide cell. He has not always been listed as a suicide uh, prevention um, inmate. He's been kept in this 55-bed uh, uh, unit and the beds, he does have a normal size bed, same size as everybody else. The cells are not six by 10, like what um, Sir Ozzy said. They're eight and a half feet by 12 feet. 
Uh, the beds are bolted down. They're metal. And they, he does have a mattress on top of it. The day he went up there to visit him and he took that picture of him, um, they had took Richard Allen back to his cell to change his clothes. He had, he had tons of clothes in his cell to change into. But he chose not to change his clothes that day. Um, and it was documented. So he wanted to go in and see his attorneys. And so when they brought him in, um, and then in most county, newer county jails and, and, and prisons, videotaping is done when you have a client and an attorney, but the audio is not done. So they do videotaping, but not audio of that visit. And I think that's to prove that he, they did have access to him. Um, but they didn't like that because the room that they put him in had a big glass window. And it was the biggest room they had up there at that prison. And that prison is old. It used to be a mental health hospital years ago. And they turned it into a prison. And um, according to the warden, they are building a new facility there. But it is old. I think it was built in the 40s. So anyway, they put them in a room that had a glass window. The videotaping was taking place by a handheld camera. And I'll tell you what the judge said about that at the end of the day. But anyway, it's normal. And if he would have been moved to Cass County, his, his visits with his attorney would be videotaped, but not audiotaped. So that that's just normal procedure. So when you saw that complaint uh, from Mr. Rossi, again, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, but anyway, that is completely normal. Uh, with Captain Gary Lewis, um, he'd been with the department at that at that with Indiana Department of Corrections for five years at that prison, um, and he has had the most interaction with with Mr. Allen. Um, he said that Mr. Allen, um, there's days he won't eat. There's days he's engaging. There's days he will eat. And that he does buy a lot from the canteen. Um, he buys a lot. He has extra clothing. He has bought uh, extra shirt, t-shirts, extra socks, extra underwear um, that Lennon is picked up on Wednesday and then returned on Thursday, but they always have three clean, the prison issues, three clean outfits a week. Um, he's allowed a shower three times a week, and they, of course they take him out of the prison. I mean, out of the cell for that, because in the cell is only his bed, his mattress, does have a toilet and a sink in it. I think like the, it's like in an ICU, how the toilet and the sinks act is one thing. Um, the showers are not cut in the cell. They walk them out. Anytime he is moved, and this, I checked with my husband, it's the same protocol they use. They are handcuffed, and they do use um, restraints around the waist and the feet. And then they secure them with a black box, which can all be connected and then it just takes one key to unlock the black box and it loosens them out. Um, so anyway, he's he is escorted at, at least with four guards. Anytime he's moved from his cell to take a shower or to go out to the rec room, he is escorted. He also, now that he is on a complete suicide watch, he also has a video camera. In that bedding, in that unit, there's 55 beds. Five of the beds have video cameras, and he's in one of them. It has a camera. But that's not always been the case. Um, just now he's now he's into that. Um, and it was asked, you know, what, what causes him to have the most, you know, the prosecutor asked, well, what causes him to have these mood swings and stuff? And... Uh, the response was, well, usually whenever he gets mail, uh, legal documents from his uh, a defense team, um, it upsets him, and he goes into these mood swings, which I can imagine he does. So, um, Captain Gary Lewis went on basically just to explain daily activities. They're very limited as far as in a met security anyway movement and 
you know, you got to think of the safety not only of him, but the safety of the officers that are working inside the facility and then the other inmates. Yeah, there's a lot of bad people in that prison. <laughs> there's a lot, a lot of bad people in a lot of these prisons, but, you know, are they keeping him safe? Yes. Are they transporting him? Yes. And they're willing to do, to do so. And we'll go into what the uh, warden said here in a minute. So that was Captain Gary Lewis. Um, again, he, he, he said the most interaction with Gary, I mean with Mr. Allen. Uh, the next witness that uh, the defense called was Sheriff of Cass County. Now, he was a state, from what I understand, he was a straight trooper at one point in time. Um, I'm going to try to say his name and not slaughter it. Edward Schroeder, Schroeder, something like that. Um, anyway, they, the defense was asking him about if if they moved him to Cass County, could they keep him safe? Well, he said, we would do our best to keep him safe. Um, the issue is they're shorthanded. And he made it, he said it right out loud. He said, we don't want him. We don't want him. But if the judge orders him to be moved there, then, you know, they're going to keep him there. Um, but they will not transport him. And that seems to be a big issue with transportation, um, which, again, I asked my husband about since that's his field of expertise. And that is one of the most heightened time is during a transport of a prisoner to a court hearing um, is one of the most anything could happen during that time. So that's the most high risk time is during that movement. And that seems to be the biggest hang up here is the movement. Um, if he was moved to Cass County, um, Mr. Rossi said, it would be so much easier on him. It's right across the street from me. I could see him. I could work harder on his case. And uh, he's not been able to really work on the defense too much because he's having to handle all these problems with the IDOC. Or that, now, this, keep in mind, this is Mr. Rossi's side of the story, not nobody else's. Um, Cass County said their cells are 12 foot by 7. And if he would be on a suicide uh, watch, he'd be kept in a padded cell um, with a mat on the floor in a suicide vest. Um, the issue there is, he said, they don't have health care around the clock. Um, their health care is from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. at Cass County, and they have very limited mental health. And according to the warden and then according to the captain there at Westfield, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, um, Mr. Allen is seen by medical or mental health almost every day. So he has access to that 24-7. And so that is a plus for him to be kept up there where he would not get that. And at least the sheriff of Cass County was honest about about it. He didn't want him. He didn't want that responsibility. It's a big responsibility to keep be able to keep him alive. Uh, Cass County is about a I'd say about a 25 minute drive. I think it's because about 25 minutes to get there. Um, we drove it yesterday. So um, or last night or something. Yeah, last night. So then. Um, after the sheriff of Cass County, it was about noon, and so it was a little bit afternoon, probably five after, and the prosecution wanted a break to go get something to drink or something. Anyway, um, she, uh, Judge uh, Go had him come up to um, the up to her, and they discussed. They were up there talking for a few minutes, and they decided they would take a lunch break because they had to the state. The defense was call, done calling witnesses, but um, um, it was the state's turn to put on witness. They only had two, but the one um, the prosecutor said would t probably take over an hour, and he was correct. So um, we all took off after she dismissed us. 
Um, a few people stayed in places, covered everybody's seat. Everybody was kind of polite about that, didn't try to move people around. Um, I did notice the uh, acoustics was better. The sound was better after we come back from lunch break than it was prior to. But then again, the prosecutor, on his, when he called his first witness, asked him to use his outside voice. So we come back into the room. Kind of the same thing happened. The defense, the prosecution entered. Um, they then brought, you know, the they brought several deputies in, placed them around the room, and brought Richard Allen through. Now he entered on the east side of the courtroom. There's a like a wall and a place for everybody to walk. It's at that point he saw his mom and Kathy, and he briefly stopped in his steps, looked at them, smiled with sitting right there watching him and he told me he loved him and then they walked him on um you might have read where they said that the staff had to help him stand up or sit down or whatever that was because of the bulkiness of the chains in the movement of the, of the chains plus he had a vest on which had a black box attached to it and i'll explain you to you what that is here in a minute so my husband said the weight of the chains and stuff and the extra equipment they had on him probably weighs about uh, 10 to 15 pounds. Um, the vest with the box probably weighs a little bit more than that. He said probably about 10, 8 to 10 pounds, depending on which size box, which seems small. But I would say his weight, I would guess him at uh, Richard Allen's weight now is probably between 141 to 50. Um, he looks like somebody that had went through like a oh like a stomach like a gastric bypass to lose weight that's kind of how he looks so it is kind of shocking when you see people that have lost weight um i do feel he is medicated somehow um they did talk about how depressed he is on some days and other days he's not depressed um so after that um, the judge came out, we started over again, and the state's first witness of the two they called was Tony Liggett, who is now the sheriff of Carroll County, but he also was the lead detective um, when this was going on. Now, he wasn't, the way I understand it when he explained it, he wasn't always the lead detective. Um, it got to a point where everybody involved had to appoint a lead person from their department. So he became the lead detective for Carroll County in this work, in this group that consisted of state police, the FBI, DEA, and other ones that helped out with the case. Um, Tone, uh, Mr. See, the Sheriff Liggett, um, the prosecutor asked him, he said, do you think you can keep Richard Allen safe in the jail and he said no he was he said I can't I can't guarantee his safety at all he said I work with such a small staff he said and like today he said I have everybody here working he has a very limited jail um crew working skeleton crew basically working um in the jail but they only have room for 34 inmates and if they send anybody out so they may send them to White County or Cass County, and usually you have an agreement signed, uh, like a mutual aid type thing, and then the county that sends them out pays the other county for keeping their prisoners, and they're charged so much a day for that, and I can't remember how much it is. Um, so then um, they talked about transportation to and from the courthouse to the jail, which is you can look across from the courthouse and look to the southwest and see the the jail. And so more than likely they would walk him unless he would be at risk of something else. And then they would have to put him in a vehicle and transport him. But he just wouldn't, he wouldn't be receiving any medical help like he does up there. But that's not available to, in, in Carroll County. Um, and either is mental health. Uh, they are building a new jail. Um, we didn't get to see the site yet. Um, this morning, it was kind of nasty up there, so um, we didn't get to go and explore that. 
Um, and then Mr. Rossi started in on Mr. Liggett. And he questioned the safekeeping order and why he felt it was necessary to obtain that. And he tried to explain, you know, so Mr. Liggett, Sheriff Liggett explained that he thought it was best to keep him in IDOC where he gets, where he has safety, where they can, IDOC can transport him and offers to do that for Carroll County since they're not able to. Um, the IDOC, which got brought up a couple times um, about continuing to transport them, that's not going to be their job to transport him for another county unless they're in his facility. Um, I'll answer some of your questions as I get done here. So the big thing, again, he was trying to um, to get Sheriff to Tony Liggett to, um, um, he asked him, do you know of any credible threats that have been made to Mr. Allen's life? And Tony, Mr. Liggett, I'm sorry, Sheriff was, uh, Liggett said no, he wasn't aware of any. And so he, the defense was trying to say, well, how can you say that they're, you know, he's at risk of somebody else hurting him if there hasn't been any credible um, complaints of that yet or none that they know of. And then um, the prosecution, Tony, I mean, Sheriff Lit, Tony Liggett also brought up the safety of his personnel there at the jail that he didn't think it would be a safe situation to keep him there. Um, let's see. So that pretty well was that, um, the sheriff, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Rossi went on to question why he does, why he can't, why Sheriff Liggett can't ask Indiana State Police to transport, um, if he was moved to Cass County, why couldn't they ask the ISP to transport or the Department of Corrections or the FBI since they all had a hand in the investigation. And he said, the state of Indiana spent millions and millions of dollars on this case, but yet you're trying to tell me you can't find somebody to transport him. Well, there is special <clears throat> teams that do transport him. Also, you got your federal marshals that transport prisoners, but this would be on a constant basis back and forth. So overall, it's easier to keep him in the Indiana Department of Corrections and they do the transportation. They do it safely. They know how to do it. So they've been doing it and doing it safely. But Mr. Uh, Sheriff Liggett was very honest about that. But uh, Mr. Rossi didn't like his answers. So the longest witness of the whole day was probably the warden of Westfield Correction. And his name <laughs> is John I'm gonna try to Gallup. Gallop, G-A-L-P-O, I believe is his name. Um, he has been with Indiana Department of Corrections for 27 years, just from a military background. Um, <clears throat> I would say he's probably in his 50s, uh, very well-spoken, uh, very matter-of-fact. Um, I was very... Um, uh, very impressed with him about how he stood up for his staff and he did a really good job. He got drilled big time, let me tell you what. Um, he got questioned by Mr. Rossi as far as why was his client put in a plastic chair when there were soft chairs that he could be sat at during this visitation and consultation and anything that he could dig at. So then he, he there was a few times that it got kind of, you could feel there was a ten, very much tension between the two of them. So I don't think Mr. Rossi has made very nice with the corrections department up at Westfield. And I think that's very obvious. They don't mistreat at Mr. Allen at all. I think there's a lack of poor communication between the defense team in the Indiana Department of Corrections. There was numerous questions brought up about emails and letters that were sent to different people and uh, how 
he's uh, Mr. Rossi's having to fight the Indian Department of Corrections, and he hasn't been able to work on the defense for Richard Allen due to all these other issues. Well, Mr. Rossi was the one to me feel like he broke the gag order by sending out that picture and what and the attached letter to it. But, you know, that's between him and the state. Again, he asked, and then he asked um, this uh, warden, he said, well, can't you guys, if he moved into Cass County, can you guys not transport him over to Carroll County? And he said, that's not a decision I would have to make. That would have to come up from the, the superintendent of the corrections of Indiana. The biggest hang up it seems like was the safety in these smaller cell jails, which yes, Cass County would be safer, but they have no medical after 10 o'clock at night and no mental health routinely in the, in the prison, I mean, in the jail. Um, the warden went on to explain that Mr. Allen does have a, he got originally was given uh, a tablet um, most inmates have to earn time, show good good behavior, and they get a tab tablet. And they can download music, they can download movies, and they can make regular phone calls on it. But the phone calls, you have to list who you're calling, and they have to be approved by uh, the staff. They have some, you know, a department that handles that. And that's a common thing everywhere you go. Um... He is the only inmate, the only person being held there that has that right to have that in his cell and to make cell phone uh, phone calls with it. Now, uh, somebody asked about texting. No, is it he cannot do texting with the device like um, in the other case with Miami. They don't allow texting. Um, something happened and Mr. Uh, see, and Richard Allen's um, iPad uh, pad got broke. Usually they charge him $250 to replace it. But in his case, since that was his only means of, of communication, and he did, they did give him a new tablet um, to make sure he had that way to reach out to whoever he wanted. He also has a lot of face-to-face -face visits. Um, he has to go through the proper process, which is filling out a piece of paper, basically filling out a piece of paper uh, and sending it to the warden with the names person on it and address and stuff. And as of yesterday, he only had three names written down. And I don't know whose name. Apparently, Kathy is one of them uh, because she did visit with him on May 30th. Um, let's see. Then he was drilled really hard, um, but like I said, he kept his composure. He was very professional with Mr. Rossi, um, even though, you know, Mr. Rossi couldn't get a rise out of um, the warden. He stayed very focused on what was being asked. Um, so then the defense asked, was their turn to question the warden? And the warden, he asked the warden, he said, is Mr. Allen safe in your facility? And he said, he absolutely is. And he said, do you feel like you could keep him safe? He said, absolutely, I can keep him safe. Um, you know, and then he asked about transportation. He said, as long as he's in the Indian Department of Correction at Westfield, uh, that they will continue to transport him as ordered by the court. Um, every time he's transferred, there has to be a court order written from Judge Goal. And um, so then the order goes in, then they transport him. Yesterday, I didn't notice, um, compared to the other times where they had uh, six or seven bigger people that transported him, I think there was only like four that got out of the van. There was a large group of law enforcement from the Indiana State Police, DNR, uh, state police, and then um, I think a couple of them might have even been FBI agents um, that were there. Um, and they did have the guy out there screaming and hollering at Richard Allen as he got out of the van again, and then some other lady told him to shut up. And 
<laughs> that made it on the air somewhere. I'll try to find that and post it on here. That was kind of interesting. But that gentleman, I guess he goes all over the United States where there's a high-profile case, and he'll scream out questions like that at people. Um, so after the questioning, it's all done by all the witnesses. Uh, the defense started his closing arguments as to why he wants him moved. And a lot of, a lot of things was, I, I feel, I, this is too long of distance. I can't. I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't. And then uh, the prosecution said, you know, I think it's best to keep him where he's at, he's safe, we don't have a problem with transportation, which we would if we move him anywhere. And he said that if the judge removes the safe keeping order that's in place right now, that Richard Allen would be moved back to Carroll County. He would not be moved to Cass County. He'd be back in Carroll County. So if she drops it, then he goes to Carroll County. Um, the Like I said, the defense was not happy. And then um, Mr. Baldwin brought up, and I, I really liked the man. I saw him engaging with Mr. Allen, and he seemed to engage a lot with him. And you could see them talk to each other, Mr. Baldwin and, and Mr. Allen, um, and they brought up the trial date. So uh, the three attorneys, the prosecution and the two attorneys went up to the bench, and they looked at the calendar, and she didn't have her calendar with her. It was in the office anyway. Her assistant was with her, and she was able to get it up on her phone. So... He did not want to waive his speedy trial, but agreed to date because that worked both for the defense and for the prosecution. The prosecution really wouldn't have had a, too much say in it as far as that goes because he didn't he didn't give up a speedy trial. Uh, usually, a speedy trial would have happened can happen really quickly, like within a hundred days or something like that. But in this case, everybody agreed to the January 8th through the 26th of 2024. And prior to that, the jury will be selected from Allen County. Uh, they will be sequestered uh, during that trial. And there's a lot of things that go into protection of that jury when they're under, uh, when they're actually hearing the case. Um, she did say that uh, she will... As I said, told you guys, I already mentioned, she will put it out in written, a written decision regarding where he will be continued to be housed. Personally, I feel like she's going to keep him where he is. I just kind of got that feeling. She did kind of scold Ms. Arazi um, and mention that you have known all along since you accepted the case where he was being housed. And she said, you seem to bring up the word I, I, I part of it as far as being an inconvenience. And she's she's truly a strong woman. <laughs> I got to give her that. Um, so anyway, um, we'll have to wait. I, I would say by Monday, Monday or Tuesday, we'll, we'll probably have a, maybe latest Wednesday, we'll probably have a ruling on where, where he's going to remain. With that trial being like what, six, seven months away, I'd say he's probably going to stay. That's just my best guess from everything I was hearing because there was no way, like she said, there's been no, there was no answer given of how they would transport him. There was no solution to that. Um, even if he was moved to Cass County, there was no way to say, okay, this is how we're going to move him. Nobody would agree to transport him back and forth. And that is a big risk in transporting him. So I really do look, think that she'll keep him there. But the biggest t things that did come out of this was yesterday. And I, I have to admit, when his attorney, the defense attorney, Ms. Rossi, stood up and said, in his own words, that on multiple occasions that Mr. Allen had had admitted to uh, the crimes that he's been accused of, but he feels like um, he switches his mind back and forth a lot. 
sound familiar? Kind of does to me. I don't know if there's something in the water or something. But anyway, um, then um, the warden also brought the fact that Mr. Allen had wrote five or six letters to him. And he brought up the word confession. And the defense shot him down. So there are that. The thing is, when you get into these jailhouse confessions, or even though it's not a jailhouse, it's a prison, the thing is, what else? Did he say anything that would slobber that he did, in fact, do it? I think that's probably um, one thing they were looking at when he was saying that when he was confessing. Um, an interesting thing that came up was that um, Sheriff Tony Liggett went up in January to try to interview him again. And um, there's a little back and forth between that's when the defense let it in and said, but that didn't happen, did it? And he said, no, it didn't happen. And so he just wanted to re-interview him again. And I think they had got, there were some words brought out about, and again, this came from Ms. Rossi, about uh, leaking, things getting leaked out. I haven't seen a whole lot. There has been a few things that have been leaked, um, but as far as that goes, you're going to have that. It's just, it's going to happen. Um, they talked about the companions. Um, these companions sit with high-risk um, inmates that may harm themselves. Usually, um, they're like porters or something like that. That they're, they they're paid by the state. They're inmates of the prison, but they make a few bucks so they can buy from the canteen. Um, Mr. Rossi brought the fact that yeah, they go back to the main part of the prison and talk about these inmates. And the warden said, "Well, I don't know about that. I can't say that that happens. They know they're not supposed to talk to the inmate they're sitting with." So now what? And like I said, uh, Richard Allen hasn't always been in a suicide prevent, uh, cell. He currently is on a suicide watch. And they also have his companion now is a guard. A pers a, there's a guard that sits outside on a, on a seat outside his cell. There's a video camera pointed at him um, because he is on a suicide watch. I don't know what's triggered this. If he's just gotten more, uh, the, see, the warden seen the warden said the more legal paperwork he gets, the more depressed he gets. Um, uh, he chooses sometimes he'll eat, sometimes he won't. But he, he said he buys a lot of stuff from the canteen, food wise. Um, the food in these prisons, a lot of it's pretty bland tasting. A lot of it's chicken based, soy based. Um, but they can buy all kinds of food from the canteen. Um, the warden did say that Mr. Allen would engage with people sometimes, and sometimes he didn't want to talk to people. Um, they're allowed one hour of rec time, be in, you know, either inside or outside the the. There's like a fence outside. They can go outside and play basketball or whatever. Uh, they get that one hour five times a week. He gets a shower three times a week. And he gets fresh clothing once a week, which is three suits plus anything other laundry that he sends back. The question came up over the outfit he had on in that picture. And the warden pointed out that he went back and watched the video of that day. And that outfit he had on in that picture was the one that he wore every single time that t-shirt he wore that color t-shirt and that jumpsuit whenever he went out to rec and um his attorney uh, mr rossi said what well, is it always soiled and tattered like that and he said no he hadn't he had some clothes in his cell and he had new clothes in his cell but he chose not to change out of what he went out in the rec um he, he chose not to change his clothes before he met with the attorney. So, you know, you got to take that for what it is. Um, I don't think that the warden was lying, but I do think you can tell there was a lot of tension between those two. Um, but um, 
That's about all I have. Um, my, let me look at your questions here. Um, oh, Todd, you were all welcomed. Let me go up to the top to see what kind of questions. I'll come down that way. Let's see, Victoria, Clark, hello, Curtis West, here, not here for long, good, me either. I'm going to leave this up for, uh, I'll leave this up for you guys to watch later. Um, sorry, this is, mm, mm, but I'm, I'm kicking back. <laughs> um, Karen, place, Atkinson, thank you. You're welcome. You guys are all welcome. You're an awesome group. Um. You don't require a whole lot of, of watching over. Sometimes I have to warn people, hey, let's be nice in the sandbox, you know, because sometimes emotions can get kind of strung out. Um, I Yes, I was able to see Mike and Becky. Um, we got to eat with them Wednesday night when we got up there in Tara. Um, it was a big day. Yesterday was a big day for them. Um, uh, Family-wise, Libby's family, uh, her mom was there, um, her grandparents were there, her sister was there, um, her aunt was there. I did not see Derek there. Um, Anna, let's see, her Abby, Anna was there. I talked to her a little bit, and that was more or less about the Christmas boxes and some stuff I had for her and different things we talked about shortly there during lunch break. And her mom and dad was with her and then another gentleman. Uh, Carrie had brought along uh, her two daughters, which would be Libby's half-sisters. And I believe that was her husband that was with her. I'm not 100%. Don't mark that for me. Um, it might have been her dad. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Becky, I don't know about bless my heart or not, but I am glad to be home. Um... Okay, uh, Michelle, hello. I'm just jumping on. Do you think he's refusing to eat? Yeah, I mean, the the ward made that clear. So the, cap, the captain that he he has never went more than four days. He in order for him to be considered that he's hung that he's refusing to eat and going on a food strike, he has to go four days and not eat anything. And they put a feeding tube in you, and then they feed you. So. They do do things to make you eat. Um, so, but a four-day crisis, it has to be a four-day crisis before, I mean, four days before they call it a crisis. Uh, sorry about the camera. It's just the way I had to set it up and, and, and read through my notes, guys. Um, doing the best I can do here. So that's um, Michelle. Yeah. Uh, Linda, he's, yeah. He would get supplement feedings if he went more than four days without eating. Uh, Bobby, hang on. And if they weren't doing all this, they'd cry that they weren't doing enough to keep him safe. You're correct. Um, that's a big thing. It's a big responsibility. And Cass County Sheriff, he's come around and said, we don't want it. <laughs> um, and transportation is a problem for them to provide. So you're right. It is a big responsibility. And it's a high profile case. It has been for many years. Um, I will tell you, I think there's going to be a lot of evidence that comes out. Um, I don't know how much we're going to get from what she'll release. I really don't. You guys are all welcome. Um, I plan on going up for the suppression hearing whenever they do have that. Um, I don't think the video recording is done as a lip reading method. They do that um, in in all county jails, the newer county jails even. Um, in fact, they're even searched. The attorneys are searched prior to going into the, to a conference room to meet with their client. Um, you don't actually focus in on their faces. They focus in on their heads and they get a picture of them together so they can prove that, um, you know, not so like attorney can't say well you didn't have any access to your my client but they have proof on video they did but they cannot audio tape now the judge did rule yesterday that 
he did not have to have, they did not have to have videotaping anymore of the client of Mr. Allen and his defense team. Um, and she would send, she was going to send that order out to the Department of Correction. So that did come up. She did do that. So it led me to believe in some of her things that she ordered that she's more likely going to keep him there. But we'll have to see. I mean, she could do anything she wants. Um, I'm sorry if it's freezing, guys. It wasn't showing up as being frozen on my end. Oh, you guys are all welcome. Um, no, um, Fred Sintern, um, I, they didn't discuss that. I imagine within the next month, you'll probably, maybe two months, you'll probably see somebody put in that request to see if it's going to be televised or not. Uh, Judge Gill's courtroom um, in, in Allen County was part of the pilot program in Indiana, and she really is very um, open. Uh, she likes the courts to be open to the public, but I don't know if it's the funding, if the state has to pay for the camera, the feed out of that courtroom, or if it's the county. Not, that's going to be the thing. If, it, if the county is made to pay for that expense, I don't see it being televised. They just don't have that kind of money. Um yeah, there was a there were several reporters there. Um, they they were complaining about the sound, but I mean, I we could hear pretty good from our point. But then again, we were really close to um, the defendants and the defense team. And um, like I said, there was only um, one attorney, one prosecutor, prosecutor there yesterday. There were other things going on in the courthouse. And even those people that came in to do business in the courthouse, they were treated like us. We had to go through the search, uh, you know, how they take electric, uh, make sure you don't have anything on you. Yes, I left my weapon <laughs> locked up. So I didn't carry it in the courthouse. So if you have any other questions, you can put them down here. I'll see if I can, if, if I forgot something, I'll just post it down here for you. Um, in the next week or so, we'll probably see add microphones and speakers. They're going to have to do something with the microphones and the speakers inside that courtroom. Um, even with – now, you could hear – and I think that's why there was an, some type of adjustment made because you could hear more clearly in the afternoon compared to in the morning. And to be fair, the captain uh, from Westville – he was a very soft-spoken man, uh, very polite, um, and very professional. They all were. All the law enforcement that was called, uh, Sheriff Liggett, um, ex-Sheriff um, Toblesby, who is now the deputy sheriff, um, Cass County Sheriff, um, and then, uh, let's see, there were several state police people there. A detective Vito was there. I saw him briefly. Um, oh, the bigger guy. Yeah, I can't remember his name. Tall guy from the state police. He was there. Doug Carter was not there yesterday. I didn't expect him to be there. Um, and they did bring up the fact, ask about the Indiana State Police transporting um, Richard Allen back and forth. and. It's not their job. That's, you know, that's right. It's kind of their role and responsibility as the state of Indiana. And the transportation of a prisoner is not one of them. Um, or it's not routinely done. So, but I think with the trial that it's going to be as close as it, it, it's going to happen, really, I just um, really look forward to keeping them there. So, we will have to see. Um, there's a lot of people that came up because it was kind of confusing. They, since court didn't start till 10, they thought they probably would be okay coming in around 9 and trying to get in, but the seats are all full. I would say by 8.30, that courthouse is full, uh, except for the reserved part. And um, Abby and Libby's families didn't come in until about 15 minutes before the, the hearing even started. Thank God they didn't have to stand, sit there and wait, you know which they shouldn't. And I was kind of surprised that Richard Allen's family was there as early as they were. I don't know. There was a lack of communication to them as when the actual 
court was going to take place at 10 versus 8.30. And maybe they didn't get that memo. I don't know. Um, my heart definitely hurts for all, all of them. I mean, for Libby and Abby's family, it, it's a, you can't replace what they lost ever. Um, and it, it's not closure for them. It's another chapter. Um, I do feel for a, any mother. Uh, there's a, a lot of silent victims here. Um, Kathy looked like she had lost a lot of weight. She looked she looked more frail than what to me than what her husband looked. Um, when his mom weeped and, and kind of gasped when she saw him, it's like and you're sitting right next to her. It I mean the whole courtroom was so silent and it just it, it made you kind of made your heart hurt for her because you know we're humans we're all humans and it, it's sad the whole the whole thing is sad now i don't know richard allen's daughter did not come she was not there but i don't think she lives in the state of indiana so and again this is the last minute change as far as what time uh kimberly uh what type of hearing this was going to be again we were going to go for a suppression hearing Originally, it was going to be a bail hearing, but I think they realized that he's not going to be granted bail. Um, he's just not. It would be such a huge safety thing for, for him. He wouldn't make it. I mean, if he's suicidal on the inside, he'd be suicidal on the outside. So I know it's hard. It, it definitely was hard to hear his mother. As it went, I don't know. Maybe it's just because of my job that I did for so long. To see anybody in pain is, is kind of hard to, to watch and listen to um, because you're actually watching the death of your, your son in front of you. But unfortunately, you know, I mean, they'll get to see their son even though he'll be in prison. But Libby and Abby, they don't won't get to see, you know, their family won't get to see them. So it's a, like a double-sided sword. Uh, but not to have any feelings would be very callous. Um like I said, there was a, the emotion was very high, and the tension between, um, there wasn't a lot of tension. It got snappy a little bit between the prosecutor and the, and the defense. Um, but I think, uh, I know many people have questioned the pro this prosecutor. I think he's going to do fine. Um, he was very calm, collected, didn't seem to get upset about anything just like he just ray got me um so i i, I do hope that everybody kind of there's a lot of emotions that are going to come out during all this um next week as things start to get opened up files get opened and unsealed don't know what those are going to be but that could be some heartbreaking stuff in there um so anyway we will see what happens then um, but we'll keep you updated on the website, like, as it comes up. But any questions you guys have, if you want to put them in there, let me know. Um, I am going to contact the court Monday to see if I can get a transcript of what happened. Usually you can, and I mean, I'll pay for it, and then I'll just post it to the group. I will not watermark it, <laughs> you guys, so you can use it for whatever you want. I just want you guys to be able to, to read it as if you were there. Um, that way you get it. You don't get the feeling of it, but you can at least read and and it's the stuff yourself. What was said, and you can watch different reporters. Um, they're they're meant not to give emotions and to tell you what facts, but they also don't share the little moments and the different things. Um, like I said, it was there was periods of time when he was when Richard Allen was walking. It was eerily kind of eerie feeling watching him walk in because if you even with the restraints on his legs and th the way he held his shoulders it kind of reminded you of the guy in the bridge I mean but then again you, it's not fair to compare him now in the shape and the size that he is to what he was prior to going to prison uh, being incarcerated uh Kimberly, according to his defense team, uh, Mr. Rossi, according to the prosecution, and according to the warden, yes, he did admit to the crime. 
Now, the question there got become, will become, did he give them any more information that makes his confession um, true? That he, in fact, did commit these crimes? And did he have information that only whoever did this would know? Because you got to remember, so much has been kept, like, sealed. So he, had, he gave them information that none of us, that nobody knew about, but the detectives and people that worked this case. Uh, yeah, uh, they're going to use against him. I mean, he, his attorneys did get it squashed right now, that subpoena, but they did admit it's coming into, it will come out to the, in the trial. Uh, and they know it. They know those documents are going to come out in the trial. And the warden had gotten, either five, he said five or six letters from him when he confessed it. I don't know if he and Richard just don't, if he's done, he just wants to be done. He don't want to put his parents or his wife through it. And he's coming to the realization that could be life or how the rest of his life is. I don't you know. It's really hard to say. Um, he did seem medicated. I even tell you that. Um, and then by the afternoon, he was more alert or seemed more alert. He was engaging with Mr. Uh, Baldwin more than anybody. Um his attorneys, and we got to keep in mind, his attorneys hired to defend him. Rather, he made admissions of the crime or not, and he's going to use some other. There is he. He was not insane or mentally ill at the time. I mean, I would question that. I think somebody that would kill a child is kind of like has issues. But at the time that the crime was committed, he was a. You know, he wasn't mentally incapable, you know, mentally. Now, they could argue, is he mentally capable of going to trial at that time? But then he'd have to waive his speedy trial. So, anyway, it sounds like he wants to get moved on. Uh, Mr. Baldwin sounded like he wanted to move forward and get it going and get, get it over with. So, anyway, we'll go from there. Again, I try to keep you guys up, updated. Becky Price does a good job posting um, different updates off of my case. You don't like them, don't look at them. Uh, I have a couple people that are kind of rude, and I appreciate every one of you guys that are on here that help other people with questions and other members that you might have the quest answer to. We really do appreciate that. Just try to be mindful of each other and be try to be kind to each other uh, in this group because that's what it's all about. It's it, and, and don't lose focus of who really who this justice is for. It's, it's for Libby and Abby. And we got to make, we got to, you know, sometimes you got to put your personal opinions way in, help each other understand the process. We have a lot of people from out of this country that don't know U.S. law or any part of U.S. law. So try to help each other out. We're, uh, Terry and I and Julie are always around. Um, but we also, you know, do things in our own life too. Um, there's also, we'll try to keep you updated at the park. Um, I did get some pictures. I'll try to get those downloaded. But um, there's a bike rally coming up, the big one, up at Indianapolis. They got a couple cruise ends and things. But anyway, I'll try to keep you updated on that. The families overall, they were upbeat. Um, Anna, um, a lot of people, <laughs> I guess, I personally like her, but she's younger. Um she, I don't know why people feel like, I mean, I, I think she's awesome, but that's just my personal opinion, but she could be my daughter, too. She's got, she's not very old. Um, Mike and Becky, you know, they have been, Mike has been pretty well um, the spokesperson. Um, Chelsea's been attacked over and over, and I don't go for that. You're going to pull that crap on this page, you're going to do it. <laughs> you're going to be out of this group. There are, you know, I don't like the YouTubers that are fighting each other. That's just, that is just total nonsense. Because, like, you're losing all the respect.
and you're showing you're not showing respect towards Libby and Abby by doing that. And we gotta keep that in mind. So I want you guys to all um you all to kinda help out each other as this process goes along. Um as it goes down, uh Terry, I Terry's gonna try to come down from Canada and live. So I definitely will be going. Um, that's winter weather, so I'll probably just rent a place for a month and plan on being up there. So, but we'll try. should be updated as soon as I know when that uh, website is up and running I'll let you know it so you'll want to check that out again don't go paying behind a paywall to read those documents we can download them for the people that don't live in the United States and can't open them and download them onto a page and put them in a file here for you guys to look at. Um, but don't go paying to watch that, to read things when we read them or else you can't read. Um, there's devices that you can put on your phone that can read documents for you if you want. 